Strauss Zelnick has been the CEO of Take Two Interactive since January 2011. He is also a partner in the private equity firm ZMC since 2001. His mission as the leader of Take Two, one of a small group of video game giants, is to be the most, quote, innovative, creative, and efficient entertainment company in the world. In 2022, the company completed the acquisition for $13 billion of Zynga, a leading mobile gaming company, which is a game-changing move for Take-Two overall. Welcome to The Grill, Strauss Zelnick. Thank you. It is not your first rodeo at The Grill, but a lot has changed in the gaming world since the last time we spoke. Let's start with the acquisition of Zynga, which was a huge move for your company. Uh, tell us why it was important for that to happen, the degree of difficulty, and just going forward, how it changes the, your strategy. Well, we were already a leader in the console and PC space, and we believe we had already the best collection of intellectual property in the space. However, mobile, which is the fastest growing part of the interactive entertainment business, just represented about 10 or 12 percent of our net bookings. We wanted to have greater exposure to this high growth area. We also like the fact that mobile spoke to a different audience than our core console and PC business. The mobile business skews older and it skews, skews more female. Uh, we were looking for a company that would fit with us culturally and very importantly would also have a big collection of owned intellectual property. So mm. many uh, interactive entertainment companies, including mobile interactive entertainment companies, really rely on one, two, three, four titles. Zynga, uh, through its own acquisition program as well as organic growth, had an array of intellectual properties. So we think together it's a powerhouse of, of owned intellectual property that speaks to every part of the interactive entertainment it's, business. It's bringing in a different audience. Different because audience because and different products. Grand Theft Auto, is, is, which is, say, your biggest signature title for many years now, is Skews Mail, obviously. It does. It skews mail. Right. <clears throat> it, uh, and uh, the mobile business tends to skew female, although there depends on the title. Uh, for example, we have a soccer manager title, which, which skews mail, called Top 11. On, so, Zing on Zynga? It's part of Zynga now. It was actually part of Take Two. And when we joined forces, we moved the T2 Mobile Games Group into Zynga. Sure, sure. So, mm -hmm. so in terms of um, why it fit, we also felt culturally. And that was of paramount importance. Uh, I got to know Frank Jabot over a three-year period. Uh, Zynga was growing. They didn't need a partner. They didn't Z Zynga need Zynga didn't always have the greatest uh, cultural reputation, <laughs> let's well, be I honest. Think Frank, and, and Frank brought in a new team mm -hmm. um, years ago. And How many? Maybe five or six. I think six, it was uh, like four that. or five years before yeah. the transaction, and he really transformed the business in terms of increasing its scale, increasing its importance, increasing uh, its success. And yes, uh, he had a, he had a meaningful impact on the culture as well. And and when we started getting to know one another, uh, we felt like there was a great cultural fit. And probably one of the best parts of this combination has been how well we fit together culturally. Are they, they're based, Zynga was based in California, right? They're based in the Bay Area. They're opening a headquarters in San Mateo in a matter of days. But that means that you're just working on both coasts now, so it's not... A, well, we're a pretty distributed company. Right. Uh, so... I, this is kind of an absurd question post-COVID because everyone is everywhere, mm -hmm. but... Well, not really. Still. I mean, we do work in studios physically, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we will. Um, and Zynga's headquarters, for sure, are in San Mateo, and Take-Two's headquarters are in New York. But the bulk of our operations are all over the world. So Rockstar has a New York office and is really headquartered in Edinburgh and in London. Mm -hmm. um, 2K is headquartered in Novato and has studios all over the world. Rockstar has studios all, all over the world. So, mm -hmm. And Zynga has studios all over the world, and some of their biggest studios are in places like Turkey and Finland. You feel like in this post-COVID world, you do need those studios. You need your um, engineers, your designers, all of those people working in the same place. Because I think most software companies are like almost indifferent to it. To We're that. not indifferent. We are flexible. We do think it's good for people to be in person, and we think that the the locus of creativity is more energetic when people are together in person. Mm -hmm. However, we do allow people to work remotely a couple of days a week and we're very flexible about remote work. And, oh, I see. How much, I was just about to ask how much pushback you get from people. because By I, being flexible, we don't get very much pushback. You don't get very much pushback. No, but, but, but again, we really encourage people to be in the office at least three days a week. 
if there are extenuating circumstances, um, then we'll be flexible. I don't believe in fully remote businesses in, in most instances. I, I'm with you, but I also have just talk across the board with managers and executives who come up against a culture of people resisting. I'm confused so. about that just because, you know, our office is really nice and I don't know about yeah. you, like I don't want to spend all day at home. You know, it yeah. sort of amuses me that we spent two years in the pandemic desperate to get out of our houses and then as soon as it ended. No, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, I'm much more efficient. I get like yeah, all of that, right? So we have seen uh, high levels of productivity at home. I mm -hmm. think what we miss is that spark that you get in those serendipitous interactions that you can't arrange to have on Zoom. Yeah, I, well, you're, you're preaching to the choir on that one, I, I agree. Okay, so talk a bit about, because we, we've had, I don't know if this is your third time at the Grill over the years. At least second. At least, no, maybe third, I think. Third. And we, we've always talked about mobile, and it's always been like, what are you doing about mobile? So now that you have this kind of giant, first of all, it's, it's pushing your revenues to, I guess it's almost $6 billion this right. year, right? We've, we've guided to just shy of $6 billion in net bookings for the year. A, a big chunk of which is going to be attributable to, to Zynga? Yes. Right? Yep, so, nearly half. Um, I, I mean, I, I kind of have a million questions about, about all of that, but I guess let, let me just go to sort of the macro view of things in gaming. Consolidation is what is happening in gaming with Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard. I mean, I know that deal hasn't closed yet, but I think most people think it's going to close, right? You think it's going to close? It's hard to know. Um, I can't really predict what the regulators will do. We're certainly of, uh, of the belief that it's a good thing uh, for Microsoft and for the industry. We're in favor to, for whatever. Why? Reason. Why do you think it's a good thing? Because this is a Consumers highly fragmented. Consumers might disagree with you, by the way. <laughs> well, it's up to the consumer to vote, of course, but it's a highly fragmented business, and there's plenty of room for creativity to go around. And Microsoft is an ally of ours, and if this makes their business more powerful, we think that's good for us. Well, yes, but they're acquiring a software company, and that's your business. And last time you were at the grill, we had Phil Spencer, and you talked about how you guys worked collegially, and it wasn't a problem in the areas where they have games and you compete, and it's all very friendly. But isn't that different if Activision is like their core focus? Ultimately, the consumer votes. And yes. if we create great hits, which is our business, the consumers will show up and no one can take that away from us. No one can replicate that. Us, uh, replicate that. So, uh, well, but in terms of like promotional space, in terms of what Microsoft might push, they have, you know, they have options. They have. Right, but at the end of the day, if they're focused on the power and strength of their own business, they're gonna wanna be pushing the most successful properties. And if consumers are showing up for our properties and uh, Microsoft isn't engaged, isn't involved, isn't a partner, then that would be a bad thing for Microsoft. So I think we're, we're all essentially pulling in the same direction. It isn't, the, the entertainment business is the antithesis of a fungible commoditized business. Mm -hmm. Every title stands alone. So it sort of doesn't compete with anything else. For time. And, and, it, and yet it's highly competitive in a way. In other right. words, we compete with everything and in a way we compete with nothing. You can't replace one of our titles with another title. It's not like you want to go to the movies on a Friday night to see the new Top Gun movie, and someone puts something else out that you're That's less interested in. That's not true at all. In, That's not true at all. That you're less interested in. No, I just in, totally. Then you, you're still going to want to well, see Top Gun. Well, my interest is well, if it's if if it's sold out, uh, I might and someone can go promote, to the other one, or, or yeah, it might be like you know I'll see it next weekend. And uh, sure, and that speaks to having an array of properties, which we do, but marketing something that people don't want to see heavily isn't going to make them want to see it more. So, from your perspective, consolidation is a good thing or a neutral thing or a neutral thing but you didn't feel that that you needed to you know bulk up for lack of a uh, of a better term in in the landscape that you're living in certainly not we were already at scale and we said that we were already a over three billion dollar enterprise we certainly had the throw weight to invest in the most important properties in the business mm -hmm. and to market them as aggressively as anyone else could where you need more scale is when you can't afford to do that. You can't afford to field a worldwide marketing and distribution organization, or you can't afford to have a loss, by the way. And we've seen that in our space where companies were too thinly capitalized to survive a bad year. Now and then you have a bad year in the entertainment business. You have to be capitalized well enough to withstand that and to give your teams confidence that they're gonna live to play another day. Now, mm -hmm. fortunately, we haven't had 
bad years uh, very often. Well, you've had, yeah, I mean, the pandemic was incredibly um, beneficial for the gaming industry. It was. You know, that was... Not for everyone. I mean, it, it was for most of us, but you still have to put out great titles. Right. Yeah, but people had time. They were Certainly in their did. houses. They needed to... And they were willing to spend money. And they were willing to spend yeah. money, right? Then, because they weren't spending it anywhere else. They weren't traveling. They weren't exactly. going out to restaurants. It was, it was, you know, it's a terrible thing to say because it was such a tragic period of time. It was good for the entertainment business. But that's do you feel that has waned, oh, right? Oh, for that, sure. Yeah, that's and not. And we're the exactly case where we said during the pandemic we expect it to be, which is to say, I said at that time, and when I was asked repeatedly, we felt that post-pandemic demand would be higher than pre-pandemic demand and lower than demand during the pandemic and that's exactly what we've seen. Mm -hmm. Are you back to just pre to pre-pandemic levels in terms of your own? That's kind a great of question. Roughly. Roughly. Or, or, or ahead in certain instances. I mean so for example by comparison the film business as I'm sure you know is not anywhere close to back to the theatrical to the distribution business is nowhere close to where it was um, before the pandemic. No I think right? we'll think I think we'll see that overall demand in 22 will be bigger than in 19 but perhaps not by much and for us as a company yes. And the recession, if that we're going to call it a recession. I'll I don't be know happy to call it a recession. You call it a recession. Yes, I mean, it's not, sure. it, I don't know. If, I'm never quite sure. Is it a recession? Well, Do you feel look, like we're in a recession? We have meaningful inflation. It, you know, for consumers sure. Consumers, therefore, have less money to spend on discretionary purchases. And we are seeing the effect of that in the entire industry. Right. That could be just pressure on consumption. As opposed, to like you know, jobs, unemployment well, so jobs. low, yeah, unemployment and we're still a, and the economy's right. still growing. Right. Um, no, people are working. I feel like it's a political question. That I mean, like it should be an empirical question, and it has become a political question as to whether we're in a recession. I think from an empirical point of view, we are indeed in, in a recession. You do think so? We've had two quarters of negative growth. Right. And okay. Then some people in Washington wanted to redefine what, you know, what it meant. But from my point of view, from if you want to define it in the context of consumer demand, yeah, we're there. Okay. So your expectations are set accordingly in terms of people holding back on spending. And of course, your big season is Christmas, holiday. Well, we're not that seasonal of business, but yes, for certain titles, we, we, we are affected by and the you, And you're expecting more modest. Well, we, we expect to do fine in the context of the guidance we gave, but the guidance right. that we gave is in the context of a softening economy. Got it, okay. I just want to finish this point on consolidation. Do you feel like um, consolidation in, in the gaming sector is, like, done, or <coughs> there's talk about whether EA might get acquired? I don't think it's done. You don't and think it's done? Now, that doesn't mean that you know, I'm making a prediction about a particular company, mm -hmm. uh, but there are a number of uh, interactive entertainment companies outside of our purview here in the United States, and I think there'll be consolidation among those potentially. Mm -hmm. what, um, what do you have? So, what's top of mind for you? Well, I'm not going to mention any names, but there. Well, are, you're not in charge of them. It's not like you're unless you're <laughs> buying them. Then, then, we, so would, there, there then we'd like to break that there news. There are companies in Asia, for example, and I think you might see some of them trade. Not Tencent. No, certainly not. Think, <laughs> they'd be think, the, they'd be the acquirer. I think they would likely be the acquirer. Right, right. But okay. they're under some pressure as well. Because of their stock price and just right. general state of the market. Well, speaking of stock price, your stock, it, like most stocks, are, it, your stock is down significantly since the beginning of the year, or something like fifty percent. I don't believe it's down fifty percent, but it's down meaningfully. Yeah, it's not down fifty because okay. it's not even down fifty from its peak. So it's yeah okay. Well, it's it's come back it's from down. its low. I want to say it's down about thirty in the year, and it's come back a bit from its low. Okay. And quite a bit. We, and down more than the S&P overall. I believe that's true. Right. I think the S&P is down 17% yeah, or something like that. Oh, it's certainly down more than that. More than that, yeah. So uh, t talk about what, how much, how you think about that. Uh, well, if you think, you think about it, it's like not much I you can do. Since I capture the exact number that it's down, obviously, <laughs> you're obviously. that much stock. Look, at the end of the day, the stock <laughs> price ultimately reflects how we do. I have a feeling if you were talking about the stock's peak, you might know the number, but... <laughs> <laughs> I know the, I, trust me, I know the trough too. It was 104, and I know the peak, it was 214. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't manage for the day-to-day -day stock price. We manage for the long term, and on that basis, we've done great. And you do have to measure your stock performance over a long period of time, and over any reasonable period of time, we've outperformed the S&P, and we've outperformed our peers. Meaning over what period of time? Five years, okay. seven years, mm -hmm. three years, mm -hmm. uh, ten years. Um, maybe not one year, even one year I think we've outperformed a number of our competitors. 
Not that I think that's anything to write home about when you're down. <coughs> However, I don't argue with the market. You know, the market has re-rated the sector, and I think a lot of stocks are really cheap. But Fairly, who, unfairly? Well, again, uh, the market's fair by definition at any given time. Do I think that there's been an overcorrection in certain areas? I do. And if you look at some of the multiples that companies are trading at, and I'll take our, ourselves out of it so it doesn't sound like I'm selling, you know, selling my book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Paramount Global's trading really cheaply. It's got a 4.1% dividend. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense to me mm -hmm. at all for that company. Warren Buffett made a big... Uh, you know, I think Warner Brothers and... Discovery is trading really cheaply. That doesn't make any sense to me. Really? AMC is trading really cheaply. Yeah, Warner Bros. So. is getting beat up So I, I think you know there's a re-rating, and the market does tend to overcorrect in the same way that there are times when we've certainly seen in the last three years some stock prices that were much higher than I would have subscribed to as well. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily our own, but I've seen companies where that, you know, the prices made no sense to me whatsoever, and they've corrected, and in certain instances, overcorrected. So, for example, SPACs, <coughs> I was never a huge fan, but now just the fact that you were de spacked and you're a public company now has hurt your valuation. For sure. Obviously, that will change because eventually you trade on the fundamentals. We, too, will trade on our fundamentals. But do you think the SPAC model is going to go away? Well, I've been skeptical about the SPAC model for a very long time for an array of reasons. You know, it's, and I had to wait around a long time to be right because it was a very powerful run for a long time. But ultimately, yes, it's a really tough model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. So, but realistically speaking, with your stock down, with the consolidation, do you worry that Take Two is could be a target for acquisition? As you know, big as you are. As you know me, I worry is not actually something. I'm not a big believer in worry. Do you think worry. about, do um, you? Not really. We're a public company. All public companies right. are potentially available and you know, if someone shows up with a meaningful cash offer at a meaningful premium, every public company has to engage whether they like it or not. Uh, you know, we like being independent. We've created an enormous amount of value as an independent company. Mm -hmm. We're now at a scale where, you know, we, we are a major in this business, mm -hmm. uh, and there aren't many of them. Yeah. Uh, and um, depending on what happens, you know, we're either the number two or the number three pure play in the space. Publisher. Mm -hmm. Worldwide, mm -hmm. developer and publisher. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty good position to be in. So I think we. Oh, that's like a, a diminishing number. It, you could argue also that makes you a target because right. the. But to, to answer the question. Because you fill, you fill a need for, say, another. I think the, large there's company. every reason for us to be independent. And independent companies that are creative but at scale tend to do better than divisions of big, massive companies. We've seen that over and over again. And that's why there are conglomerate discounts. You know, there was a period many years ago, decades ago, when conglomerates got a big premium because there was a perception that they would do a great job running all these disparate businesses and generate a lot of value. But in the last 20 years, generally speaking, big conglomerates have taken a discount over the sum of the parts. And so we think it makes sense for us to be independent. However, we're not entirely in charge of that part of our destiny. Mm -hmm. What we're in charge of is making hits or not, running a great business or not, having a great culture or not. We aim to do all of those things well. But do you feel that now that you've sort of filled that sort of missing piece of mobile in your business, like you're, you, you have the, the, the main elements that you need to kind of drive the company forward in the way that you would, would want to and be a market leader and a leader in innovation and what was your mission statement, creativity and efficiency? I, you just said it better than I could. All I have to do is take your question and turn it into a declarative. We'll be all set. Yes, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. Very but much you, what you said. Yeah, you, so you feel like that was the kind yeah. of the missing piece. And if you look at our history, so we've been at this at Take Two for 15 years. Yeah. The bulk of our story has been organic growth until the Zynga combination. We did a couple of small acquisitions in, in mobile to mm -hmm. get into that business because we weren't having any luck getting in organically. But the rest of our growth story has all been organic. And I think the, the bulk of our growth going forward should be organic unless and until we reach another fulcrum point where we say, you know what, this is a line of business we need to be in. It's a big piece of business. We can't build this piece. We have to buy it. In the case of Zynga, we could not credibly build a mobile business of that scale in right. any reasonable time frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, and so we should expect all of the, the traditional take two titles, the sports, the, um, you know, all, all of your games to be now created in a mobile translation, <laughs> iteration? No, certainly not. Not? No, because 
not every piece of intellectual property belongs uh, in mobile. Not every piece of intellectual property should be a console title. It depends on on. I'm surprised the to hear property. you say that. I mean, I would think that you'd want to use that, you know, scale your IP across all the different ways of delivering that. Conceptually, you'd love wise. to, but each one stands alone, mm -hmm. and so. So what, what what would you sort of think about bringing into the mobile universe? That specific you know? titles? Yeah. Yeah, I'm probably not going to talk about specific titles because we don't we don't even announce them once we are developing them, until we're ready to close to releasing them. But we are looking at our entire portfolio of intellectual property, and we have said we would love to bring some core Take Two IP to Zynga to produce mobile hits out of it. Like? It's a really hard thing to do. It's a uh. really hard thing to do. So one of our competitors has done it really well once and Call of Duty, and it's great mm -hmm. uh, in mobile. It's mm -hmm. a wonderful uh, expression of the intellectual property. It was developed by a third-party developer. They did a great job, and it's very successful for Activision Blizzard. Um, but that's once, and most of the time, first of all, mobile has a very low hit ratio as a business, and most of the yeah. time, if you try to take a piece of intellectual property from one venue and translate it to another, it's hard. It's hard to create a hit. So we'll do it. I hope, and we'll do it very selectively and focus and make sure that we enhance our odds of success at, to the extent that we're able to. But we won't do it across the board. I also wanted to ask you about, um, generally speaking, most times in the past five or six years we've talked about gaming as a sector as we compare it to, say, film or television, and we've just watched gaming overtake by massive numbers in terms of revenue, users, pick a metric, um, film and television. E even, I, I think that's probably true, even, I haven't looked closely since all these streaming services came online and they're all gonna end up, I think, cannibalizing each other <laughs> at the end of the day. We talked about that the last time we spoke, actually. Remind me what we, what we said. What we said. What I said about streaming services, yeah, yeah. I said there would not be one winner takes all and there will be a lot of failures. Yeah. Well, now that you see all the streaming services that are out there and you use them and since you have no, no, no dog in the hunt, which do you think will survive and which do you think might not make it? Well, I'm probably not going to be critical of any of my friends, but I wouldn't bet against Netflix. I wouldn't bet against Disney. This is Netflix and Disney are very well positioned because they both have a lot of scale in programming, both library and original. I think if to the extent that you have smaller scale, it will be more challenging. So Disney, you know, acquires Fox. They have massive scale on the library side and have really important ongoing production and they speak to kids and kids are kind of the barker for streaming services into the household. They're the glue in the household too. You may decide you want to, you know, churn away, but your kids don't want to. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a real advantage for Disney and Netflix, of course, has this massive subscriber base and, and first great creativity position. and first position. Right. Um, I'm not counting out the other folks. I just think it's going to be hard. And you, I think, by which you mean Peacock. Yeah, exactly. Paramount Plus. Precisely. And I, I think it will be challenging. And I think you can't bet the whole company on streaming. And that's the big shift that you're going to see in the next few years. There are a couple things I believe will happen relatively unpopular view, but I'm happy to share them. One is that... The less popular, the better, please. Yeah, Thank I you. Mean, you know, production spending is going to go down. Now, the history of production yeah, I think spending that's for in sure. Hollywood is it has, gone for up decades, and up and inexorably up. gone up at a rate uh, rap more rapid than the growth in GDP. That's not going to happen for the next few years. There's going to be a retrenchment. Why is there a retrenchment? Because all of the streaming services believe, look, we're going to do everything in-house that we can. We're not going to distribute outside. We're going to have a walled garden because what we care is subscribers. What we care about is subscribers because that's what Wall Street cares about and they're gonna value us that way. And Wall Street's turning around now and saying, actually, now that we think about it, we are concerned about cash flow. Uh, we are concerned about profitability, mm -hmm. not just your number of subs. Mm -hmm. And people are gonna have to start thinking that way again. Uh, all of these companies will have to think that way. Um, the second problem has been the, the belief that just spending money on production would acquire subs is going to be uh, offset by reality, and reality is um, people are going to churn. You know, they don't want 10 services. They'll binge something on one service, they'll finish binging, they will easily churn out because you can do it easily. They'll churn into another service and they may come back. I, I just don't want to interrupt for one second and I'll let you continue, but it's so funny because we are presenting research at the grill that says exactly that. It's a new study that we're presenting um, on day two. I didn't even have to wait for the study. Yeah, you yeah. just sort of feel it, but it, that is what's happening. The idea that you are now, now a, like a 
annual subscriber to any streaming service, including Netflix and Disney, is n no longer kind of something you can count on, and right. that people are going to hop around because we're they just are. we're not going to so subscribe. So here's what happens. Yeah. What happens is we've gone to all this effort to create streaming with with the goal of big entertainment companies going direct to consumer and not having intermediaries. And with all this effort and all this money, we're going back to pay-per-view, essentially. Hmm. Yeah. Essentially, we're going right. back to pay-per-view. So I believe that basically everyone in the business is going to have to do what we've always done in the business, which is we'll have our own services that speak to consumers, perhaps through wholesale, perhaps direct to consumer. Uh, there's no reason not to be wholesale as well, if that makes sense for a reason. You mean like, a, a, like a Roku cable, or whatever, whatever? Yeah, yeah. Cable, Roku, whatever right. whatever consumers right. want, wherever they want to be, as Direct long as the terms TV make sense. Is. And we will also distribute off-network uh, when we make uh, great programming that's already run on our network. We're not going to be able to keep everything in-house. The final point I was making is production spending has to decline because people were justifying production spending because that was allowing them to acquire subs. But... If people are churning more than you expected, then your metrics are all off because your metrics in this direct-to-consumer game are, are unpredictable. your cost of acquisition, right. your percent churn in a year, yielding your X lifetime number. value. Mm -hmm. And if you Just have underestimated your churn, mm -hmm. you underestimated your acquisition cost, you overestimated your lifetime value, which is right. your cash flow. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is what's got to change there? What has to change is the production spending. Okay, but that it becomes that can become a death spiral, I would say, because the less you spend on production, the, the lower quality. So it's the, not a death spiral because people are overspending, because production spending well, has that's, gone up so much. Yeah, but we already have the kind of tyranny of mediocrity across the streaming services. I which I mean, there's an element of that, but I think that comes from spending too much, not too little. In other too words, much? I, yes, in other words, I think because production spending blew up so much, so many hours were produced, that we got back to mediocrity as opposed to doing what HBO historically did, which is spent a lot of money on really great stuff. And that's what we it's, need to I, do. It's, it's, it's multi-layered because one of the things we're doing at The Grill this year is talking to producers about how they are not incentivized properly in this kind of business ecosystem. Too. Oh, really? How's that going to change? The producers will be very happy to hear that. Wow. No, because, wow. You, you know, again, when the world goes back to more limited spending, everyone's going to want the best stuff made by the best people. And because they're not going to be able to take the same economic risk, because Wall Street's not going to bail you, at, bail you out based on the number of subs you have, people are going to want to share the risk. And to share the risk, you've got to have back ends. And we'll go from, you know, this cost plus program that That's was right. implemented a few years ago That's right. back to a back end program for two reasons. That the streamers are going to have to do a back how, how do you do a How do you do a back end when you don't have They are going to receipts. be distributing off network, to my point Oh, earlier. I see. Okay. They will have receipts. They're going to have to. Uh -huh. They're all going to have to say, we're going to have a network run effectively, and there'll be off-network runs. We can't just keep it all I mean, all the truth inside. is also they know how many people are streaming any given show, yes, so course. they could have it, but they don't they know They could have a synthetic back end. But yeah. the point I'm making is they'll have an actual economic back end as well because everyone, in my opinion, over time will see all right, we folks, can do both. We heard that here first. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, I mean, Maybe right, maybe wrong. I guess interesting. So in that, so so final question then, where does gaming live? At? What I, where I started with with this before we went down a little bit of a rabbit hole on streaming was that gaming had sort of far surpassed as a as a sector, right? Film and television, um, and is growing more rapidly, and has been growing more rapidly. Will continue probably to. a decade, I would say, uh, right? Yes, Pro yeah. something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's a little yeah. depressing if you not to me, <laughs> not not to you, which is why we love talking to you at the grill. It has that, and then you had this like even more growth during the pandemic. So has it topped out in your opinion? Like, how how much bigger can gaming get? Like, are you at a ceiling, and then you just keep, which is a very very healthy ceiling. There's nothing no, wrong not with this. Close. So you because feel the like it's age not close? of an average gamer is still 36, 37, 38. Right, right, right. And people consume for the rest of their lives the entertainment they fell in love with at the age of 17. They don't churn away, and you know that yourself. <clears throat> the music we love most is the music we loved when we were 17. That which we engaged in as a teenager, that's what we engage in as an adult. Maybe a different level of volume, um, both mm -hmm. actual volume and the amount we consume. <laughs> uh, and that will be true for interactive entertainment. So our cohort is going to continue, continue to, to age, age and, grow and grow and then bring in new So you new know people? when you can make this point, when our cohort's it's average 60? age is 60, exactly, mm -hmm. then you can say, okay, so mathematically you you're probably reaching your asymptote and your growth will look like everyone else's growth in entertainment, which is close to the rate of GDP growth, roughly. Um, but we're not there yet. So we should be growing for the next 20 years disproportionately. Wow. Now that doesn't mean 
Take two grows at that rate. We only grow if we put out hits, mm -hmm. and so do our competitors. Mm -hmm. But we do have this backdrop of tailwinds that really help us and allow us to take measured risks and do really exciting things. So the stock is cheap, relatively speaking. Well, again, I never, I never promote the stock because the stock is a function of what we do. No, not, I did not that. Not a driver of what we do. Yeah, I'll let you do it. <laughs> Great. Well, Strauss Eldick, thank you so much Thanks for, for coming me. to the grill. It's a super interesting time. It's hard to keep up with the pace of change, honestly. So uh, it's worth checking in uh, from time to time and seeing seeing how it's going to change, you know, in the future because nothing seems to stand still anymore. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Thanks for being here. Thanks.